cool part is with the internet now, we can all figure this stuff out and we all can count. So, again, the, the reiteration of themes here is that something could be happening on December 21, 2012, or thereabouts, and every president from Truman forward appears to have somehow shared that information and has done at various levels something about it. And one guy who tried to do something about it, in fact, was murdered for trying to do something. Which brings us to this. Because the big question that I know is on all your minds, when is he going to get to the part where he tells us why Kennedy was killed and who did it? Okay, we're there. <laughs> the hero of this part of the story turns out to be the president's own beloved special aircraft, Air Force One. Now, the color scheme that Jackie ostensibly set up continues to the present day. The tail numbers have changed, or they've changed aircraft. It's no longer 26,000. I think it's now 20,000 and 29,000. But the color scheme has remained exactly the same. So I got very interested in the connection between the color scheme and the aircraft tail number. And I started researching how did this transformation of the Air Force MATS aircraft come into being? Well, one of the key players was Raymond Lowy, who was a well-known, huge, well-known designer of the 50s and 60s. And the other player, of course, was Jackie. We've all heard the story all heard the tale that Jackie, when she came into the White House, was appalled at how bad it had been preserved and how it was, you know, she used the term, it was like it had been furnished from a bargain basement. And so she began a campaign against Kennedy's wishes, by the way, up until it worked, uh, to re transform the White House, to refurbish it, to, re to renovate it, to restore it, to where it would be truly a mansion worthy of the people in whose name it is inhabited. And there's all kinds of photographs and books written about the Camelot redesigning. You, know, the, you can look up on the web anything about this that you want, but looking at it with the right set of eyes is where the story lies. So one of the things we find out right away is that Jackie hired this designer, Sister Parrish, who, by the way, was not a nun with a predilection for rearranging furniture. Her real name was Dorothy. Somehow she got the name Sister in the middle there somehow. She was one of the preeminent interior designers of the 1950s and 60s. And Jackie turned to her and basically said, help me transform the White House into the place that I would like it to be. And so that's what they began. Now, at some point along the line, she made a deal with Henry DuPont, who was very wealthy and had access to an awful lot of antiques and had, had chains of connections that allowed him to, to talk to various people about antiques and antiques that had been in the White House and had been sold on auction or on the open market and bring them back to the White House, or finding pieces that were exactly like pieces that had been in the White House in this historical period. So DuPont became a key ally. And then a third guy that they brought in was Stefan Bodin, who was head of Maison Jensen, which was the major Parisian uh, actually global interior design firm. They had offices in the uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s all over the world. Buenos Aires, in China, in, in you know, London, New York, everywhere. She turned to him to help her with this and ultimately he wound up pushing out Sister uh, Parrish uh, much to her very, very high dudgeon and displeasure, which again you can read about over and over and over again. So far, this is kind of like an interior decorating soap opera. What does this have to do with 2012? As part of her methodology of replacing the good stuff in the White House and redecorating it so that it all kind of matched and it, it communicated an historical grand message as well as being a home in which they lived, she employed these people to redesign and radically reform. This was the Blue Room prior to, uh, during the Truman and the Eisenhower years, this is the blue room that Bodine uh, decorated. Apparently incredibly high marks in the fashion and interior design world. This is the red room during Truman and Eisenhower. This is the red room after Bodine got done with it. 
This is, I think, one of the upstairs sitting rooms that uh, Parrish did. This is the sitting room after Parrish. And then we've got this room. This is the cabinet room. Now, I looked at this and I thought, hmm, cabinet room. Why, why, is that, why does that look familiar? And then I realized why it looked familiar. Because this is the floor of a Masonic lot. Bodine decorated Kennedy's cabinet room and the ceiling to match the Masonic temple ritual places of Masons all over the world. That, of course, got me really intrigued. Then I look back at these casual shots of Kennedy in the Oval Office, the Oval Office, which, by the way, he inherited from Eisenhower, who in turn inherited it from Truman. So you're basically looking at the, 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 the Truman Oval Office here, minus Truman and with Kennedy. And I got intrigued with the connection between the decor of the Oval Office and the decor of Air Force One, a la Raymond Lowy. So I began digging and digging, and, and, and finally, this year, we, we could not have done this until this year, because in February of this year, these people, the AIGA, which is the American Institute for Graphic Artists, published a piece by Paul Patton on the real Air Force One story. And what Patton did was to go back to original sources. Among other things, he went to the Hagley Museum of History, where Lowy's papers are stored, and found the most amazing set of documents. Patton wondered who might have helped. Who should also be credited with Air Force One design? What were the real inspiration? So he's digging, he's digging. He made a connection at the museum, this gal, Lynn Catanese, and she sent him a whole bunch of stuff, including actual letters, typewritten by Lowy himself, archived in this museum, which is connected to DuPont, big surprise, which tell how the story of Air Force One came to be. And you can read it here, that Lowy first saw President Kennedy's Air Force Matt's jet when Kennedy came to Palm Beach in one of his early uh, campaign trips uh, right after he'd, he'd, he'd been elected in the spring of 62, uh, I guess. And this was the one where Frank Sinatra wanted to host him, and he couldn't go near Frank Sinatra because of the mob connections. And Sinatra took a sledgehammer to the heliport that he'd built with his own hands. He was so uh, unhappy, which of course gets back to the whole mafia thing. Kennedy being killed and all that. I mean, this is, this is a turgid soup. Getting to the bottom of the soup is almost impossible unless you have a good compass. Continuing with Patton's story, Lowy met with uh, one of the president's key aides at that, on that trip and basically said, you've got a lousy airplane there for the president of the United States. Let me design one for you, and I'll give it to you. And that, apparently, is the real history of how Air Force One began. Because what Lowy did was he went to the White House in May of 62, it turns out, and he presented the, the president with a series of options. And you can read here, he says, we rearranged the panels on the armchairs. The president, without hesitation, selected one of the graphics. His choice was the one that, that Lowy also preferred. And this is what Air Force One would it look like in the Air Force regalia, except, this is critical, he picked the paint scheme, but he wanted it in blue, not red, because the president never liked red. In fact, he really, really didn't like red. And blue was his favorite color. So we get this incredibly regal jet. So then Lowy goes on in his typewritten notes, uh, when he returned a few days later, he brought with him scissors and rubber paint. That really should read rubber cement, okay? This guy, whoever wrote this, didn't know how to, you know, it's rubber cement. And Lowy set this stuff up on the floor. Kennedy's sitting in the rocker, the famous rocker, and he makes some suggestions and changes, and he's intimately involved in the process of redesigning his own airplane. Why is he involved? Because remember, in our model, Air Force One is a flying representation of 2012. 26,000 years for one cycle to complete. And this aircraft is supposed to embody, for instance, having the two colors of blue, what does that, what does that tell anybody 
If they understand anything about celestial sim 